I've one ash self bow here, the, the big one. Left one. On yes, on your left, yeah. It's uh, it's it's hefty though. Hundred, maybe, maybe. And the other one is a U one, like we were talking about. But uh, yeah, that's for later on. We were talking about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got some. That I didn't show you any of this kit, did I? <laughs> when you came over. <laughs> oh, the viewfinder's covered. Okay, we're live. Excellent. Well done, everybody, for getting that live. So, uh, welcome to the Living Longbows. That's, that's my name there. I'm Jack Pinson of Living Longbows, and I've been invited by Athlone Castle to come and give a talk about historical longbow making. 15th century mainly. Um, I'd like to give, first of all, give uh, thanks to the Irish Heritage Council for f for funding the uh, the whole the whole operation and and, and uh, for for being a host to me and to everyone else who's uh, visiting today in Nathlone Castle. Um, so thank you to the Heritage Council. Uh, let me just get over my initial jittery nerves uh, if we're going live, but I'll be right in a minute. So, um, longbow making in the 15th century. I've been studying bow making and uh, done a, I've done an apprenticeship in longbow making for um, uh, accredited by the traditional craft guild of Bowyers and Fletchers. And I passed that in 2015 and then I was a journeyman for one year and then I got my full master's level craft guild accreditation. Uh, in 2016, and I've been working as a bowyer since then, on and off, we'll say, yeah, along with other things as well. Um, so, uh, my master, Don Adams, trained me for four years, as a, I was his apprentice for four years, uh, and uh, I went up and down between uh, Balahadrine and Roscommon and Clare, where I live, for over those four years, every six weeks or so, and each time he'd show me uh, the next step of what I need to learn and practice and uh, and I'd, I'd show him what I'd done in the previous six weeks. And that's the way that we worked the apprenticeship that I did with him. So most of it's working with wood and the historical element would be making self bows, which is a bow ma uh, made from a single stave, a single piece of wood grown from the tree. Now, can I just quickly check a technical issue here? Uh, is there a particular camera I should be looking at if at all or yeah, that's okay. That looks okay. Yeah, thanks very much. That's great. Um, okay, so uh, I have a few examples and a few uh, elements of work I can show people. Uh, I have here uh, a side axe in my hand. Uh, if you can get a, a side axe means it's got a single bevel, which means it's got a, a bevel on one side and a flat face on the other. And this is a, a pattern, let's say no, let's say it's a, four, a fire welded tool steel blade into a, a, me, a medium or high, medium carbon uh, bo body made, ba made, and uh, oh, socket and body made by a very skilled uh, blacksmith. Well, let's say toolsmith. And the way I would use it, I'll show you how you're going to use it now. And I have a split piece of ash. Now that is that actually split from a tree in a storm. You can see there that it split down almost down the core. You can see the inside layers there. And uh, I haven't u I haven't shaped any of this yet my first time working on it, but I'll show you how quickly I can remove some material. So I'm looking at this and saying, I think there will be a bow down the center of this, but because there's a curve in it, like a, if I show you it end on, you can kind of see maybe there's a curve, like a banana shape almost, where it's dipping down. I need to make a straight bow out of this slightly curved stave, which means I've got to remove material from the end on this end, on this, uh, from the from this side here, on this end, and on the other side as well. But from the middle, I have to remove more material from that side to to true it up as I go. I'm not going to use a planar thicknesser or a bandsaw or anything like that because that's all modern stuff. Sorry about the microphone there. Um, I'm going to use a side axe, and I'll show you how I start. So I'll just set it up on the block where I can reach it. I have a good idea where I want the stave to be. I'm going to miss that knot, so it's going to come beside there. And 
Sorry if you're in the firing line. <laughs> So you can make some hatch marks up the side, which then allows me to come in with the side axe from above and the shaving will, will peel away just like that. And you can see, what have I done there? So that's a lot of shavings on the, well, a good few shavings on the ground and it's a whole chunk taken off the side. And what was that? You can probably look in the timestamps and see it was maybe 40 seconds or something. So the, the rough shaping of the stave can be done quite quickly, although it does tire out as well if you're not used to it. So, um, you can, yeah. Once you, once you, you once I, uh, employ this technique of making the hatch marks here, that allows the shaving to curl away and stop the axe blade binding up into the surface. Like, it's just beginning to do there, so I might come down below, loosen that up a bit, and then take it off. And it gives a fairly rough finish. That's because I'm not trying to be nice and fine with it. I can go very fine with an axe, but there's actually another tool that I might use before that. Well, instead of an axe. I could probably shape the whole stave with the axe if I had to. I don't think I would if I have other tools like a shaving horse and a draw knife, which I'll show you in a minute. So now, yeah. So we could just do uh, two hours of axe work if you like. <laughs> See how we get on. I get well into this. I just get really kind of mesmerized by just doing it. So tell me when you've had enough. <laughs> or I'll just keep working. <laughs> but you can see the idea there. It's quick stock removal to get the shape you want. Um, uh, and, uh, okay, in modern day we might use different tools like uh, machine tools like in a, in a woodworking shop, but uh, historically that wasn't available, even, even yeah, so before the advent of uh, water-powered mills even, you, you, could easily, you could definitely be using a hand-forged side axe like that. Okay, so that's the idea of like rough shaping on, on a split uh, stave. This is ash. Other timbers that I might, I would, I would use would be yew wood, of course, which is the most famous one, the best wood for making longbows with, in a European co historical context, and that would be self bows again. So just single piece bows, no laminates. And I have an example of a yew stave here. Well, we'll come to that in a bit. The next stage might be something like that, where I finished with the axe work. And I've done a little bit of draw knife work on here, and there's still plenty to do. This is another piece of ash. Uh, it's good for what, what we call mean wood bows or white wood bows. Uh, it has an, there's a bit of character in the stave. There's a bit of a knot there, a bit of deflex or sort of curve away from where the string is, and then another knot at the top there. But that's all stuff that, as the tree grows, I have to work with it work with the timber, the shape that it grows in, and not induce weak spots by cutting off uh, areas where there is a knot or a twist in the grain. I've got to go with the grain and, and use, use all the strength of the material. So if there is a knot in a certain place, like here actually, I've, I've been able to position that larger knot, I don't know if you can see that closer up or not, um, in the centre. And the centre is where there's almost no bend. There's a little bit of bend, but not very much, because both the limbs are doing all the work. Uh, this will be a full compass bow, which means it will bend all the way through the whole length of it, as opposed to a target bow where it has a riser which doesn't bend, but that's a more modern uh, style of bow making, long bow making. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll show you then the draw knife stuff. So that's over here on the shaving horse. So this bench device here is called a shaving horse. There's lots of different ways of making them. You can do three-legged ones, you can do tenoned ones, uh, lots of different types. This is a four-legged one that my master Don made and he used to use at Warwick Castle. Um, and so he's, I have it now, uh, thanks to him. So what I would do then is load the bow underneath the clamp and use my two feet to clamp the workpiece in place, which then allows my, my hands to be free to use the draw knife and the draw knife, you kind of need to have two hands on it for it to work effectively and also safely. Um, it, this is one of the exceptions to the rule of you never cut towards yourself with a blade. Uh, this only really works if you cut towards yourself. 
uh, there's ways to do it away as well, but this is the main way of using it. Um, I might have to angle the bench sideways for you to see properly. Uh, I didn't really think of that beforehand. Here we go. Just bear with me a minute. If I go that sort of down the hill, will that work? Not so stable. We'll see how we get on. I might fall off. I'll go that way. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Can you see that a bit better? Thumbs up from everyone if you can. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can see a bit there. So um, the stave is now small enough from the split, the split one I was showing you with the axe now that it will fit under and onto the shaving horse. Uh, which, as you can see here. So I'm using my legs to clamp it in place and then I can use the, the, sh the draw knife to shape the stave. And what I have there is, I'm just taking off corners and high spots that were on here from my last, the last time I was working this particular piece of ash. Uh, it was in, in the shape you saw previously and then I've shaped it down and now there's it's sort of, um, uh, there's, there's, there's sort of flat spots and high spots and I'm taking those off to round it as I go. Uh, and part of the technique of this is to use as much of the cutting blade as possible to uh, min ma uh, maximize efficiency so I don't get tired quickly if you're doing a lot of work and a lot of repeated actions. Also uh, to make a clean cut on the piece of wood as well. So I start high up on the blade as I'm right-handed and draw it down towards me. And I always remember, try to remind anyone I'm teaching that that's the best way to use a draw knife because a lot of the time you just bring it towards you straight. And that's about kind of not as good technique as you could achieve by slide, slicing across with the whole length of the blade as you go. Part of the shape of the bow. Okay, so yeah, the reason that it needs to be a certain shape, so narrower at the tips and thicker in the center, is because when, when I'm shooting a bow, I hold it in the center and I'll draw it back. And the pivot point is the handle and the, uh, uh, the um, let's say, the, the parts which are moving are right at the tip. It's probably a technical word for them as well. Anyway, um, <clears throat> with that in mind, if I was to have a, a parallel straight stave, like a, like let's say a, a two by one piece of wood, any, any wood, doesn't matter. And you put a string on it and hold it in the center and draw it back as if it was a bow, the place it will break will be in the handle because all that force is being forced into one place in the center. So to spread that force out over the length of the bow, the bow needs to be a certain shape and that means tapering it. So it tapers from the center, right in the thickest point in the center, all the way out to the tips on, on the two, uh, if you're looking at it there uh, on, in plan view, from the, from the back of the bow, as it's called. Uh, so that side is tapered and that side is tapered. But then if, you, if I turn it around by 90 degrees, this bit stays the same and follows the growth rings of the, of, the bow, of the bow stave, of the piece of timber, and this side is tapered. And so there's three tapers to put on both limbs, so that's six in all. And once that's done, I then would round off and shape, and that's what I'm doing on here, sh um, changing the profile so there's not high spots and ridges and stuff like that and making it nice and uh, de-section. So if you imagine it's sliced in half, the, there'll be a flat side and then a curved side. And the, the name for that is plano, plano convex, or it would also look like a capital D if you look at it, looked at it in cross-section. So that's the shape that an English war bow or, or a medieval war bow would have. And that's the type of bow, that's the name for the type of bows that I'm making. Um, English longbows is what it's called. There's also American flatbows and there'd be another type of longbow. But uh, again, different geolocation to what we have here in the Athlone Castle context. <laughs> um, there are other sorts of longbows as well, like the Japanese Yumi asymmetric bow. There would be a longbow of sorts, but it's a totally different thing. Uh, well, not totally different. It still shoots an arrow a long way. Uh, but it's very different to a European style bow. So the reason they're long is because they're made out of a single piece of timber, hi historically and traditionally. The, the length of the bow is usually has some bearing on how far you can draw back the bow. Oh, I haven't actually shown you drawing any back yet, have I? I should probably do that. <laughs> but anyway, this is the making part. Uh, so the next stage on making would be to put a string on a bow. Now I put a string on and start to bend the bow. We'll come back to the designs in a minute. Um, here's a U stave which I've worked on a bit more. This one is currently tillering out at... tillering, I'll come to that term as well. Tillering is... A, yeah, so it's 103 pounds draw weight at 28 inches of draw length. So that's quite strong, we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, it's getting a bit damp there. So it's U, and the reason U is preferred for longbow making is because you can incorporate the sapwood and the heartwood in the bow. Oh, come here, bowstring. To achieve a high level of elasticity. Uh, so I have I have little grooves carved in the top of, and bottom of each knock. That's just, these are tillering knocks, so temporary knocking positions that hold the string in place when the bow is braced. I'll see if I can brace this now. It might be I haven't done it for a while, so it might be on this one. It might be a challenge. So I uh, I'll, I have a loop in the string at one end. Can you see that's braided in, twisted into the string? So this is a single loop Flemish twist string, is what it's called, and that'll go over the top of the top limb. I know it's the top because that's the center line and that's the top of the handle and that's the bottom of the handle. It's offset slightly, so I can tell at a glance which way is up and which way is down. I'm going to brace this at a low bracing height because it's a bow still in production and not fully tillered. It'll go to 30 inches eventually. And tie a timber hitch in the bottom of the string at the bottom knock. And just to gauge the position, I'll pinch it there. A timber hitch, yeah, you can look, at, look up how to tie a timber hitch. It's a very useful knot. It's also called a bowyer's knot, but yeah, it's another way to do it. Uh, it means that the string is adjustable in length without having to add twists into it, uh, which is a bit more efficient. Although people say it can slip, especially around modern recurve bow knocks and stuff like that, so we don't really use it on modern bows. So then bracing the bow, I stand with my feet about that far apart, anchor my elbow to my hip there, hold the bow in the handle, not here, that, that'll break it. You've got to hold it in the handle and then push and slide with the top hand. And it's in. And I'd uh, just quickly check that the bottom hasn't come out there as well. Sometimes it can. And so that's the bow braced up at a low bracing height. Now, you, eventually, when it's finished, it'll come up. The string would touch my thumb in that position there, and that will give you a rough idea of how far away the string, the bracing height from the belly, this here, to where the string will sit. But I'm not doing that yet on this stave, because I'm still training it, or tillering, if you like. Now, how does that look? So what I've done here, I have tillered this bow, and the tillering, the word tillering is what's used by bowyers to describe uh, uh, um, how the bow bends and teaching it to bend. Tillering, yeah, as a verb and as a, yeah, I suppose. Let's not get into the grammar too much. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> so I have drawn this back to 28 inches before, and I have, in my workshop at home, I have a wall at the back of my workshop with a peg in the middle of it and a totally blank wall, so eight foot by eight foot square. And I've, I'll, I'll put the bow on the peg there and hook a string onto the bottom and draw back through a pulley with a, straight, with a rope, uh, draw back the bow from the center like that. So basically simulating the bow being drawn as it's being shot. However, I don't have that luxury here on a campaign, art, uh, bow you're on campaign sort of setup. So I have instead a tillering stick which is a mobile device for checking how the bow is bending. I'll show you how that works in a minute. But first, let's see how this draws back. And you can tell me in the questions and the comments uh, what the tiller looks like right now. It might be out, it might not be, but you can check. So the tiller, what you're looking for is the, each limb is bending throughout its whole length and that both limbs match each other fairly closely. The bottom limb will bend very slightly less than the top limb because it's very slightly shorter than the top limb, and that's deliberate to give the bow good harmonics when it's released. So I put three fingers on the string roughly where the arrow will sit if I were shooting it. Oh yeah, that's a pretty strong. I'm not trained to 100 pounds. I can do 80, but I can't do 100. <laughs> now, so when I'm shooting, I'm, uh, I would be standing side on to my target. The tar if I'm here, if I'm facing you there, the target's that way. Turn the head round to face the target, and Ooh, I got three. I got maybe half draw there. <laughs> I should probably uh, train some more, hey. But to check the tiller, I can use this, the, the, the tillering stick like this. And so what it is is a group. There's a a shape, a cutout in the front of the stick, and then a series of grooves running back along the length of the stick. And I have that marked at 20 inches and 26 and 28, 30 back down to there. So I can pull back the string to any position, let's go 20 for now, and hold it back away from me. And as a bowyer, then I can check and I can see where it's stiff and where it's bending. So I can see that there's bend out in, these, in the tip there and there. 
and I think it's probably slightly stiff in this part from there to there. Does that, can, can you answer now? See if you can see that. I don't know if it picks up on the camera as well or not. Um, but if it does, let me know and, uh, and will and ask me questions about the tiller. It's the main detail of longbow making is getting the correct tiller. You've got to also remember that it's a natural stave and has its own shape. And so there might be bits when I take off the string again, where you'll see, oh yeah, there was a kink in the wood there and it was, it would take that shape anyway. But I think this section from here, maybe even over the handle to there might need to be uh, a, a bit more free to bend. I don't know if you can see, so it kind of looks a bit like a crossbow. Okay, so I've turned it round now. So I'm looking at that bit there. Does that make a bit more sense? You can see that better? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the bow on the tiller. I wouldn't usually leave it on the tiller for this amount of time. It's just taking a bit longer to explain what I'm doing than I would usually hold it there for. It's not a question of holding the bow back in its drawn position. It's more a question of a quick check, a visual check to see where it's bending and where it's not, and then exercising it by drawing it back and releasing just like that. Not releasing, sorry, no, letting, uh, coming down as they call it. That's a word for not shooting the bow when you're at full draw, just coming down gently again. Uh, so you should never dry loose a bow is, is, the, is the key point there. So uh, with that in mind, I could do the next stage of tillering right now, which might be removing material from that bit which I just mentioned. Now, can we remember where that was? just above the handle from for about there. So I might just put it in here and shave a little bit off, not too much. Another uh, way to do it could be with a, a scraper, a knife blade and a scraper, but I'm just gonna take a little bit off with a draw knife first. But it's, it's, fine, it's fine work at this stage. Another tool I could use would be uh, a bowyer's float, it's called, and it's what we might know today as a rasp or a surform. I have an example of one here. Uh, I've got to turn this way around for the cable. So there is a small example of a, a bowyer's float. It's actually made from a hoof rasp uh, and the, the end has been drawn out by a blacksmith and curved to be comfortable in the hand. I'm not, I wouldn't use it on this actually right now. I've already gone past the stage where I'd use that. It's quite coarse, but I would use it on let's see, uh, on the ash stave we looked at earlier. Let's do a bit of that so you can see what it looks like. So it's slower at removing material than the axe for sure, and even the draw knife as well. But it does allow for me to work over awkward parts of the grain and just take off high spots where a, a bladed tool like a draw knife or a spoke shave would chip in and and, and, and follow the grain and, and, and dig it out by where you wouldn't want it. Uh, but this, with its multiple small teeth, just takes off high spots and doesn't chip out and, and split into the grain. I don't know how much of the uh, sound is coming out on the microphones there. I <laughs> uh, hope it's okay. So that will give me an overall shape. It doesn't give a smooth finish. It's not designed for that. It's designed for shaping. So, uh, I, I can uh, achieve a, a nice overall shape like this, but then I might have to move on. Well, I would have to move on to a different tool to get a, a good finish, which would be a smooth finish. On the the best examples of, of let's say, Tudor era bows that we have currently in existence uh, are the Mary Rose longbows, which were found on the Mary Rose warship, King Henry VIII's flagship vessel, sunk in the Battle of the Solent in 1545, um, preserved in the silt. Under, uh, in outside of uh, off of Portsmouth in the UK, uh, and a lot of those bows show exam uh, show on the surfaces tool marks, as if they're not finished. But we kind of know they were finished, as far as as far as archaeologi archaeologists and uh, experimental archaeologists and reproductions can determine. They seem to have been finished bows in chests on the orlop deck of the ship. Um, but they still have bits of tool marks. They don't have a high polished finish like we might see on modern day target bow, traditional and historical target bows. Uh, it was a, a different era where that level of finish was acceptable, I suppose. Functionality was a higher priority than high level of finish. So they were definitely functional, let's say that. <laughs> so then you come into the idea of what were they, what was the purpose of this piece of timber made into a bow? And really it came through, it was a weapon of war. It was for use against people. 
and buildings, but many people and horses, I suppose. So, um, the, I suppose one of the, well, the era where they were most, uh, were most prevalent in warfare would have been the, during the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses, and that was very much focused around uh, France and England fighting each other, and then a civil war inside of, of the Kingdom of England, which at the time Ireland was part of. Uh, which a lot of people maybe don't like, and that's fair enough, and then we won't go into the politics of that right now, but it was uh, part of during the, um, the, so let's say, 1330s, all the way through, so 100 Years' War is up to sort of um, 1540s, 1540s, let's say, and then going on from there up towards, well, actually, uh, uh, it was up to the Elizabethan era, the, 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 long, the longbow was still on the, the, the armaments, uh, the official armaments, uh, statuette or books or whatever it is what they have with the army. I can't remember the, the title for it. I have so, someone in the audience who might remember, <laughs> but we'll come to that later. Um, so it was an official weapon of war for a long time after firearms had, uh, hand, single use handheld, uh, individual use uh, handheld firearms were uh, uh, in operation. But uh, in the Hundred Years' War and in the Wars of the Roses, it was mainly used as artillery, uh, as an artillery weapon to um, mass cover areas of a battlefield where the opponents were marching through or advancing into. Uh, used uh, individually uh, in a sort of a sniper setup as you might see it today as well, but uh, a lot of the time uh, pr primarily used to great effect when there's uh, several thousand archers raining heavy arrows down on on an appro approaching mass of, of the opponents of the opposite army. So Agincourt is the most famous example, let's say. We, ha we have a bit of an interruption for the moment for the sound, so uh, I'll just do some stuff instead with the axe. <laughs> and uh, excuse me, I've got to turn around that way. In the meantime, see if I can drown out the helicopter with a, with a nice bit of axe work. Whoa! Did I break anything? No. It slipped out of my hand. Yeah, so underneath. Can we hear again? Helicopter's gone. I'm sure they were doing something very important. <laughs> Where do we get to? Arrows and the use of the longbow. I have some here. So the, the question might be something like what, what sort of arrows were being shot and how far could they be shot? And here are some examples of the types of arrows. These are replicas that I've either made or acquired through various means, been given or bought or whatever. Um, and they're all as close as I can get to, to replicated from the era of the use of these bows. So we have hunting arrows, arrowheads in here, and also military arrowheads as well. That one is a, is a target arrowhead, and it's a Mongolian style one, so we'll put that aside for now. Very nice it is too, made a horn on the end of it. Um, then, so these arrowheads would have been uh, created, crafted by uh, an arrowsmith, who would be a specialist blacksmith. Uh, there's some nasty hunting ones. The ones with the barbs on most of the time are hunting arrowheads. And you can see a few examples there. Can you see them okay? They're pretty nasty. If you can imagine them being driven into uh, an animal, because that's what they were for, uh, by a heavy bow, and they, they're not coming out again easily because of those barbs. Uh, not so effective against any level of armour. So, for example, my colleague back behind me there, he's been very good, he's been very quiet. Uh, these arrowheads are unlikely to penetrate his level of protection that he's wearing. So that's uh, a padded gambeson or Akiton underneath, and then a male shirt over the top. Uh, so his vital organs are well protected from blades, let's say, bladed weapons like an arrowhead or any other kind of bladed weapon. Um, 
or well, a bladed weapon that's quite wide, let's say. So I'll put those aside for a minute, because then you've seen them uh, over there. So the next thing then is, how do you get through that development in armor of the, the male? And the answer that, that, that was arrived at was the needle bodkin, like that one there. And the, the what's that? So that's the, the profile of that is very narrow and very thin with a very sharp point and then a long taper. And the taper allows the force of the arrow to drive apart several of the links in the male. It doesn't give quite such a bad wound as a broadhead, which is the ones for the hunting that I showed you a minute ago, but it has at least a, chance, a good chance of penetrating male. Uh, so then the next development is the development of the armor, where plate armor becomes the, ne the next thing used to, to protect, uh, let's say, mostly more wealthy individuals rather than uh, commoners, let's say. Um, although archers did also have uh, coda plates as well sometimes, according to the illustrations. So that, uh, that arrowhead is likely to be bent or buckled by plate armor. And so then you need something stronger to penetrate the plate. And I have some examples of those here. There's sort of slightly different shapes and you can see those there. Let's see, where's the nice one? It's a bodkin head, it's called. So there's a needle bodkin and then the straightforward plate piercing, um, arm, armor piercing bodkin. And that's uh, a shorter head profile, so it's stronger overall and has a chance then of penetration. M any, well, depends how it hits. It has a chance. We don't, there's continual tests about armor piercing or not piercing or how does it work and how do you set up a, a test to check if a 140 pound warbow can drive that point through um, medium carbon or medium carbon steel armor that's been shaped correctly and, and well forged. And yes, yeah, so shape has a big part of the armor defense as well as the metallurgy of the, of the material. So, and, and the heat treatment of that as well. Uh, so there's, the jury's still out. We don't know, there are some instances of bodkin heads penetrating plate armor and sometimes not as well uh, and lots of different tests that show different examples but a lot of the time it's not necessarily about the penetration of the arrowhead into the opponent it's more about what that amount of arrows from those several thousand archers shooting one arrow every 10 or 12 seconds or 15 seconds if you want to be generous um, uh, what that amount those that amount of projectiles landing into an area aimed as a, as a, as the advance in, uh, gets closer they get lower and lower and more and more powerful and more and more accurate what does that do to the approaching armed unit let's say or 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 um, attacking line of the opponents it's going to force them away they don't want to be hit by it it's horrible you have to have your visor down uh, like your man behind there and these archers could pick out eye slots at, at uh, 80 80 yards it said if you can imagine that the eye slot on that helmet there being the, your target and uh the, and and as at 50 yards these archers who were practice who had practiced for their whole lives let's say and could shoot a heavy bow they would be able to pick out eye slots and gaps in armor at that kind of range and and closer obviously as well uh which is quite formidable if you're, if you're in a massed block, you're just looking at numbers then. It's like, maybe I won't get hit because my buddy might next to me instead. You know, that's not great. But then, so what do you do? You have your shield up in front of you. You have your, um, your visor right down. You're ducking your head down to avoid the target spots on your, in your faceplate. And then hopefully the rest of your vital organs are covered by armor as well. And as we see uh, in various records of the Battle of Agincourt, it forced the French to advance in a way that was disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged their fighting ability. So they were bunched up. They had to, the back ranks over, began pressing into the front ranks, which were stopping and slowing down, uh, which, uh, and then walking through heavy plowed mud as well, uh, caused them to slow down and be in, be exposed to the arrow fire for longer. Arrow fire? Okay. You might pick me up on that one. Um, anyway, so, um, and then, so then the, 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 the way smaller, um, army of King Henry V, uh, was able to eventually be victorious in that engagement due to a circumstance uh, not only related to the archers, but a strong com contingent of it was related to the archers' ability to rain, arrow, rain arrows of projectiles down uh, very effectively for, let's say, minutes at a time, because that's really realistically what it was as the, as the French advanced across about a, a, a 150 meters of 
no man's land. So that's a bit of that. What other arrowheads do I have in here? Um, arrowheads for an well, anti-personnel, but not really armored. So nasty little broad um, barbs on the back of a quite wide shaft, uh, cutting edge. Once that's into you, there's not much chance of pulling that out nicely. There's ways to do it, but it takes it's, you're, you become a casualty and a drain on your army's resources immediately once that's in, buried in somewhere inside you. If you don't die from the initial shock of it or, or, or blood loss or vital organ, you're going to have a lot of problems with infection, uh, which there was no uh, modern medicine to deal with at the time. So pretty nasty, and, and often the arrowheads, it's thought, weren't actually very strongly attached to the arrow shaft, which means that if you pull out the arrow shaft, the head could stay inside. That's one of the theories about it anyway. Uh, nasty stuff. Uh, what else do I have there? Oh yeah, there might be one. Oh yeah, there we go. So uh, I'm going to ask the question if anyone wants to get back on the live stream with a message. Um, what is that? What, what, at what specific purpose is that cage for on the front edge of the, on that arrowhead? So if we have any answers, uh, let us know. Uh, hopefully, I'll get to it by the end of the talk, and remind me if I don't. Yeah. So, uh, anyone in anyone nearby? Or maybe we'll just keep that under wraps until until later. Okay. Yeah. We have one hand up showing there. So it's a very specific purpose, and often used uh, in, let's say, siege warfare. There's a clue for you. So the other end of the arrow is uh, feather fletched. Let's use one that's goose feather. That's goose feather on on the back of there. Um, with a linen binding to hold the fletching in place, as well as uh, probably uh, a hide or a hoof glue as well to stick it in place in the, in initially, and then bound because that wouldn't necessarily stay together in damp conditions where they'd be stored. Uh, often over the top of that would go copper verdigris paste to preserve the binding and the base of the quill and to stop it being attacked by mites, let's say, because uh, that was one of the issues that they had storing arrows, and they were made by the million in the medieval era if you can imagine that, uh, and stored in advance of a campaign being, uh, uh, so Edward III uh, in, the 13, in the 1330s and 40s uh, ordered hundreds of thousands and then eventually millions as it, as it uh, accumulated of arrows to be made over a series of years in workshops around the, the whole of, well not quite the whole, no, in various places around as it is England and Wales and Gascony today. Uh, in the end, you might notice there's a little black stripe opposite to where the groove is. That's the horn insert, which strengthens the knock and stops the arrow shaft, the string of the bow and the power of the bow as it's released, splitting the arrow shaft. Uh, and so, yeah, horn's strong and dense and has a cross grain structure which doesn't split very easily. Uh, and so it's quite suitable, but it's also too heavy and too flexible to be used on a full arrow shaft, and also doesn't really come in that sort of size very easily. So a little sliver of horn or hardwood in the back end of the knock is enough to reinforce the, the string knock there, the groove, can you see that groove? That's where the string will sit uh, and stop the arrow shaft being split by that powerful 100 pounds draw weight plus war bow, artillery bow. I have a finished example of a of a replica of a Mary Rose bow here, which is which is a single piece of yew wood. Getting a bit wet out here. Oh, it won't be too long. Um, so you can see in the finished bow that it has uh, two colours in it, and that's what I was showing you earlier on the, the work in progress. I'll quickly put that away. It's getting wet. Oh no! Get in there now. Okay. So. Uh, so the sapwood is the pale colour on the back of the bow, which is the way from the archer on the outside of the curve. And then the heartwood is that sort of darker reddish orange colour on the belly of the bow. Uh, and then on the, on the ends you can see a darker section. This is oxhorn, an oxhorn side knock. And a side knock means it's, it's got a groove on one side and it has a blind face on the other. And the Mary Rose bows all seem to have had that kind of setup. The horn didn't survive, but the sort of phantom shadow knocks that are in the tips of the bows are on the opposite side of each bow, of each limb, on every single bow that I've seen. Okay, so that's the bow braced up now and ready for shooting. I would tend to oil it after it's been out like this in the wet. So the point where the arrow goes is uh, about 90 degrees to where, you're, where you hold the bow. You hold the bow, I have a little mark there, which is my bowyer's mark. That's on all the Mary Rose bows, uh, some form of mark by the handle. 
all the ones I've seen anyway. Um, and there's like different ways. It's a signature to say which bowyer made this bow. And it was a way to trace back good bows or bad bows and rate them as well. And, and to have a, um, accountability for the bowyer to make good quality weapons. And they were bought by lords and kings and, uh, and the like and, and handed out to their archers or else the archer had to provide them for themselves as well, depending on the way the individuals were recruited. So three fingers on the string, the arrow goes between there. I'll, uh, I'll not shoot it because I can't. Ha! Again, training, hey? So that way round. So that'll fit on the string there. And then I'll get it some of the way, but not all of it. This is 103 pounds draw weight. Wait, is it? 110, sorry, yeah. 100 at 30 inches. Now I can get, let's see how far I can go. Oh yeah, you can see my bow hand compressing in there and bending. Now, if I train properly, I'd be able to draw that back nice and easily. Uh, and there's, there are various people around uh, who can draw well, over to, up to two, uh, 180, 200 pounds or more sometimes. The official world record is Mark Stratton drawing 202 pounds at 30 inches. Uh, he, does, he, hasn't, he hasn't done it for a while, but he did, he did make the Guinness Book of Records in it. Uh, and so fair play to him. He's a, another member. He's a, an arrowsmith of the guild as well. But just to show you there again, that's me drawing just with strength. A better way to do it is with a dynamic war bow draw where you step into the bow and use your whole body to get back to full full draw behind your chin. Uh, I can kind of do it on an 80 pounder. Oh, I'll leave it for now. So that's, and I'd always take off the string when I'm not using the bow to release the tension from the wood to make the bow last longer and the string as well, I suppose. Uh, and then maybe put it into a case or, or dry it and oil it to keep it preserved as well. At the moment, the oil surface is doing fine in this damp, in these damp conditions. They will need drying and then putting away carefully with a bit of oil later on just to keep it nice. So there's an example of a U self bow that's of a war bow level of, po of power and maybe one day I'll be able to draw it. <laughs> okay, uh, so how are we doing on time? Is there any questions that have come through that I might that I could answer or try to answer? Or uh, or have anyone here got any questions or points they'd like to raise that I can address? Yeah? The wood is quite not free. Is that, is that, is that a function of you or is this, do you avoid the knot? Uh, right, yes, yeah, a good question. Uh, so selection of material is a, is a big part of what, you, what I learned from my master about how to make a bow. And the cleaner and clearer the grain, the better it is, uh, the less uh, fault points you would have in the, in the final bow. Um, so yeah, um, I'm always on the lookout for clean, clear, straight grain on yew or ash or elm or fruit wood laburnum as well and hazel so uh, slow slow grown timbers that are dense uh, would be would usually be the best and of course you being a softwood it's it's a bit different but uh, yeah you is notorious for growing in twisted gnarly knot filled cracks and ingrown bark and all sorts of stuff so it's actually quite hard to find good clear clean straight material uh, and so it, it, is, it does come in at a premium, the, the, the bow stave um, grade, a heavy war bow grade, grade of, of you uh, is, is, is something that does tend to cost a lot of money and also be, well, it's actually fairly easy to work compared to a, a, a twisted gnarly one. Uh, but it's, it's also, it performs a lot better over a longer period of time. Uh, and it has the ability to withstand uh, 180 pounds of pressure being run through it as it's releasing arrows. So part of, yeah, so that's a very good question about uh, clean, clear, straight grained uh, material. And if anyone has any, I'd love it. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah. Any more, uh, any, anything else there coming through or um, how are we doing? I... When you talk about materials there, just in terms of when you talk about the arrowheads, were yes. you all made from the same metal swords or was there a metal option to variable? Okay, uh, metallurgy and metal source for arrowheads. Now, I would preface this the, the, with the fact that I'm not a smith, and especially not an arrowsmith, and there are other people better qualified than me to talk about arrowheads specifically, but my understanding of it so far is that um, there are different grades of arrowheads available in, at different times through history, and uh, in the medieval era when these were most made were... Um, Mostly medium carbon steel. That was achieved through, as I understand it, through um, 
charcoal forging. So forging over charcoal introduces more carbon into the metal as it's forged. Uh, that's one. Now, there'll be smiths out there who might t tell me otherwise, and that's fine. Happy to be corrected or learn more as I go. Um, another way to harden mild steel is case hardening. And so that's um, heating to a certain temperature and cooling slowly in carbon dust, let's say powdered charcoal. Uh, other types of case hardening material are, I think, available like, I think you can use old engine oil, but it's very carcinogenic, so that's a very bad idea, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah, so case hardening was one way to harden mild steel, as I understand it, and then using a medium carbon steel through the production of, of iron into steel, and then the forge work itself as well uh, on charcoal. Um, that's how I understand it. Now there's a whole method for making those. Those are mostly, oh, well, the medieval ones are, are socketed, uh, which means that they had a sort of a flared out fishtail. I've made one arrowhead once with it, uh, so I have done it, but like not as a profession or anything or any kind of detail. Um, so you flare out the, the back end or a part, a rod, let's say a rod of, of steel or iron, and then um, curl it around a pre-made shape that you might, like a mandrel or, or some form of uh, drift, I think is what it's called. Maybe that's for axe heads. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, in my sort of like guesswork area here, seeing as I'm not an arrowsmith, but um, yeah, you shape the end and then you can make, you might make two sockets, one on either end and then cut the the middle. So you're, 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 you're maximizing your work uh, for making them. So, um, and you can forge whatever head you wanted on the end. Sometimes they're two pieces uh, bonded together, and sometimes they're made from the single the the, the rod of iron or and steel. Question, yeah, question. Um, how old do the trees need to be before cutting them to make them arrows? Into arrows. Yes. Okay. So, so the question, if it didn't pick up on, did that come through on the microphone? If it didn't, uh, Steph asks, uh, how old do the trees need to be before I can make arrows out of them? So, in a medieval um, mass production of arrows context. Arrows were made uh, in workshops with a master and then various levels of apprentice doing different levels of the task. Uh, so some of them might be splitting. Let's, okay, so minimum. Okay, so you can make arrows like um, paleo or, or, or stone age type arrows out of, or any type of arrows realistically out of small laths of, let's say hazel shoots and uh, willow shoots and dogwood and things like that and bamboo even as well. Um, but for, so that, that will work as an arrow, but you have to treat it, you have to dry it, you have to, you might bundle up a load of them together to, so they stay straight as they dry. Um, and then, you know, opposite ends together, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but for the sake of, uh, in a medieval mass production sort of, or cell production context, uh, they would be split from large logs uh, of ash or uh, birch and willows too light really birch was sometimes used hornbeam was used as well um, whatever they could use that was strong enough to make uh, well oak was also used occasionally sometimes the merry rose arrows there's thousands of those in existence still and there's been lots of uh, dendrochronology done on them as well as uh, analysis of the type of species and you can look them up um, but yeah ash was used a lot and roger asham in his 1500s uh, whenever it was, a uh, uh, book, Toxophily, uh, rates ash the highest for being an arrow shaft. Uh, so a split from a log, uh, half the log, quarter, eighths, sixteenths, keep splitting them down until you get to a square slightly bigger than nine or ten mil diameter. And there's a way to split timber which um, so that, that it doesn't run off to one side or the other and that's a bit of a skill in itself and so that job is the job of the fletcher and the fletcher makes the arrows and takes the arrowheads from the arrowsmith and attaches them to the arrow shaft and does the, the shaft production as well and then procures and processes the fletchings into well the feathers into fletchings so I'll show you what a feather might look like. okay let's spin around again um, um, a fletcher will start off with something, oh, I've just pulled that back, something like that, which you might be familiar with. That's a swan primary feather, a wing, wing feather. Uh, so the primary feathers are the five wing, usually about five leading feathers on, the, on each wing. And so that one I found at the side of a lake, from, and it's from a swan. And uh, 
that yeah it's it's not in best in the best condition possible but it will it could still be made into a fletching uh and that would really do one from one side and that's how they were made there was one at one feather one fletching usually modern times we can cut them into smaller bits and stuff like that but uh for the six inch or seven inch long medieval style fletching it would be the a full length piece so uh, each on each arrow there can only be either left wing or right wing feathers you couldn't have both because there's a, a smooth side of the feather and a coarse side of the feather and that has the effect of um, uh, generating as the arrow is in flight a low pressure side and a high pressure side of the of the of each fletching which which then has the added, the effect of spinning the arrow shaft in flight uh, so if you had one two and they usually have three fletchings on each arrow so if you had one that was a right wing feather and the other two were left wing it would have the effect of destabilizing the arrow and making it yaw in its flight and and be inaccurate so they were very careful about either using left or right wing feather hopefully from the same wing of the same goose if they can manage it or swan or turkey didn't have turkeys ha ah, that was a t that was a trick question <laughs> uh, no um peacock was also used for maybe best arrows or target arrows or arrows you use again and again these war arrows i've showed you there earlier uh, were for use maybe just once. Uh, they had to work, they might be picked up again. There are accounts of archers advancing into no man's land and reclaiming arrows, but it was uh, rarely, uh, well it wasn't done all the time, it was it was if the opportunity arose and they were already, they already used up all their arrows. So uh, the medieval war, but war arrows were often just used once, uh, one hit wonders kind of thing. But target arrows used again and again, so they were made a little bit differently and same with hunting arrows and you might know you might notice that some of the hunting arrowheads have a, a hole in the socket for a pin to be put through to hold it onto the shaft because it'd be used again and it would be uh, reused again and again so uh yeah a bit of difference there fletchings arrows more qu any more questions so that was about our, yes uh, you have any questions yet hey, could you expand a bit on the drawer a yes, yeah, uh, that's right. So, um, a question from the audience there: um, What is a drover's bow? Uh, um, a drover's bow, as opposed to a war bow, is a very similar type of bow. A, a, a self bow, full compass design, which means it doesn't have a handle riser, an extra thicker part in the handle, um, but of a lighter draw weight, and maybe something that a, a, a drover, you know, so that's a sheep or cattle drover, someone who might be. Uh, out in the fields grazing flocks for a period of time, several a month or three at a time, something like that over a summer period. They might need a bow to, let's say, feed themselves a bit and also drive away predators if possible, if necessary. Uh, and it would be a lighter draw weight bow and it would be something that might be, let's say, hacked out of a hedge. You might have found a, right, a good enough piece of um, let's say boxwood or hazel or a piece of ash or even a piece of yew maybe but probably not because that would be minded by the local parish uh, for, for warbow production. Um, so you might be working on it as a crofter or as a drover let's say um, just carving it away shaping it uh, letting it dry out as you make it and it would be a bow that would be suitable maybe 50 or 60 pound draw weight or 40 or whatever else um, just to be a more casual bow but not useful in a war bow in, in a military context it'd be too light it wouldn't send a heavy arrow like what I have there in a basket um, with the potential of driving through armor it'd be for a lighter arrow for hunting primarily and maybe for uh, flock protection we'll say uh, yeah, so drover's bow, much overlooked category of historical bow. Very similar to a war bow, but just lighter, ideally, mo mostly, yeah. Uh, uh, if you want to look up that, look that up further, you can look at Hugh Saw's book, The, the Crooked Stick, I think it's called. Yeah, uh, it, it details drover's bows in there. Uh, so, um, more questions or any more detail required by anybody? Uh, fire away. Anyone uh, on the live stream, if there's any... Uh... There's no one there. Okay, I'm talking to no one. <laughs> Very good. So um, there's plenty more in my head to, to expand on if you wanted to. Uh, and in the meantime, I can say, uh, reiterate uh, my thanks to uh, Athlone Castle for hosting me today. Uh, shame they didn't book the weather in though, hey? Sorry. Ah, Next year. 
next year we'll get the weather next year they're very good and to the heritage council of ireland as well for funding this event and uh, uh, letting me be here today to talk to you about what i like the best and what i do best in the world which is in to whatever level it is at uh, i make uh, traditional and historical longbows and warbows uh, so my name is Jack Pinson again, and uh, my business name is Living Longbows, and you can look that up if you wanted to. Uh, the website's terrible, it's a work in progress. I'm better at making longbows than I'm at making long websites, so forgive me for that. Uh, livinglongbows at gmail.com for, for uh, questions about bows, arrows, and other things related to toxophily and archery. Go ahead. Did you go to reverse back to the page like arrowhead? There is, that's right, callback question time. Yes, thank you. I had an arrowhead here, which is in the basket somewhere. I'll see if I can find it. And there was a question, I asked a question about what it is for. Uh, if I can find it again. I definitely find it, but it's in here, it's buried. The trouble is with barbs is they stick into stuff and don't come out. Like that. Ah, there it is, I see it. So, did anyone have either either know or want to guess what... <laughs> arrows everywhere. A bit like Agincourt. What that is. Did you have any guesses? Yeah. You do, or or even you know. An oil soaked rag becomes a flaming arrow. Exactly right, so it, it becomes an incendiary or fire arrow. Exactly right. So, um, the compound that was often put in there would have been something, some mix of uh, pitch, like, uh, so charcoal kiln runoff, as they have, like, so usually wood pitch, mixed with saltpeter and sulfur, the, the ingredients for making gunpowder if it's mixed with charcoal. So that's the carbon content is the, the pitch in this case, but it's gummy and sticky uh, in a paste or a resin or a block, something like that. Uh, and then the saltpeter gives it an accelerant burning power. And I suppose the sulfur does as well. I don't, I can't, I can't, I don't know the chemical addition of the sulfur, what that does for the fire. Uh, so the purpose is then you, you might wad that in there and light it off of a brazier or some or some a fire or whatever and or even a spark would catch it actually. Um, and you might notice also it's got a long socket that keeps the the fire part away from the archer's hand as it's at full draw. And usually you're going for long distance, maybe something like that. And so it's, it's on fire, it's sputtering, it's spitting. It's like, it's pretty nasty. You get some chemical burns in your hands if you're not careful. Uh, the idea being that the salt, the, the pitch melts in flight. The salt, the saltpeter keeps the flame or the ember burning. And when it hits whatever its, its target is, uh, it'll stick to it and carry on burning. Uh, and so pretty nasty. It'll do, it'll do horrible things to granaries, sails, siege engines, and then of course infantry or horses. But of course it's not really designed to pick off individual people. It might be launched over a castle wall to where we're standing here to deter and keep, uh, to set fire to everything inside if possible. It's not going to work against stone very well, but it will work against carbonaceous material, thatch, timber, uh, cloth, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, incendiary arrow. There we go. Anyone? Did anyone get that? <laughs> Top marks if you did. <laughs> there was one person on Instagram, but I'm guessing they're, um, they're connected. Um, connected. They said they're not allowed. They're not allowed to which? Sorry. I know what the arrow head is. Yes. But I don't think I'm allowed to answer. Oh yes, very good. Well, thanks for being so circumspect there, and you probably had it right. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So they're uh, nice. Uh, there's lots of different specific arrowheads, but that's one that like grabs people's attention. There's other types of fire arrow uh, fire arrowhead as well, but you don't ever fire even an arrow, even a fire arrow. You only shoot it, and that's uh, because it's not using propellant to send the arrow shaft. It's using elastic strength of the bow and the muscle power of the individual shooting is the archer as well. So there's a little misnomer for everybody to get right is you never fire a bow, you only shoot or loose a bow. Uh, anyway, uh, that's just a technical point that I uh, try to ignore as much as possible. <laughs> so uh, that's good. So we, we've got the we've got back in with the thanks for reminding me at the end there. And I knew I'd forget. Hey, <laughs> so um, yeah, that's uh, archery making in the 15th century. Uh, so uh, bow making in particular, let's say, yeah. Thanks everybody for watching. Sure. Bye, good night, okay. have a good day. <laughs> I can get out of the rain. Yeah, it's... I'm so conscious of your wet shoulders. <laughs>
<laughs> they are they are definitely damp. It's a, I'd say you know. Yeah, but it's okay. I have other clothes.